and be able to stretch here in the middle of our evening service. I'm not, I'm not what I ought to be, and I'm not what I want to be, but by the grace of God, I'm not what I was. And I'm not what we're going to be either. Our glory in this is the subject of the coming of the Lord. Just we turn from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven. Now you, you can't be a Christian and not turn from idols. <laughs> you as well forget about going to heaven if you're not going to serve God. And you sure can't go if you're not waiting for his son from heaven. It's sort of a triad. It's something that it just happens when you're born again. You uprooted from this world. You don't belong here anymore. So you're looking forward to another one. And that's what this uh, series of meetings is about. Well, my subject tonight is the passing of the natural order. That when Jesus comes again, what I have called a natural order is going to pass away. Now my text is found in the book of 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 10 through 13, and verse uh, well, 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come, it will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation or manner of life and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, looking for it hasting, running toward the day. Not a day we have a seeker service as they call them. It's not nothing like this in the Bible, you understand, but this is something that the opportunists have come up with. It's made a lot of careers for people. Seeker services. I'm for instituting a fleeing service. One where people flee from, flee from wrath to lay to Christ to lay hold on the refuge set before them. That they flee toward the coming of the Lord and rush toward that day. What's well, a day in which the whole natural order is going to pass away? Heavens are going to be on fire, pass away with a great noise. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The earth also and all the works are going to be burned up. It's going to be a climactic event, noisy affair. No way this could happen secretly, I'll tell you that. No way at all. Now I want to take a moment here to define what I mean by natural order. <laughs> by natural order, I mean everything excluding personalities that had a beginning or a genesis. Everything that had a start. Excluding personalities. That's a natural order. Whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. Hebrews 1, 3 stretches our minds a little bit. Some of the other versions translate this different, but the word is actually uh, through whom Jesus, through whom he made the worlds, plural. And it, it is plural, too. Plural, worlds, it stretches your mind a little bit. This is the natural order I'm talking about. It's bigger than just where we're at here and the world. In fact, in Colossians, the first chapter, verses 16 and 17, he elaborates a little more on the natural order. He says that through Christ, he made everything that was made both visible and invisible. Thrones and dominions and principalities and powers, all things are made by him and for him. Now, that's the thing I'm talking about. When I talk about the natural order. Well, Philippians, the second chapter in verse 10, it looks at it a little different. It says things on the earth, over in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. <laughs> about the time people think they know everything, I'm trying to find what's under the earth. See, all that's a natural order I'm talking about. The whole thing is going to pass away. It's going to be burned up. Great Holocaust is going to happen. And actually what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do is make you non-combustible. <laughs> That's what it's all about. So that when it goes, it's all going up. It's all going up in fire. 
But like, who cares? If you don't, if you don't go up with it, who cares? Let it go up. That guy's going to be good riddance when it goes. Now, in the original order, the creation was a good. In fact, Genesis 1 31 says, God beheld everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Very good. Very good. This is a project humanity, you might call it. And when it got underway, Job 38th chapter says that the sons of God shouted for joy. <laughs> Project humanity underway, the earth made all the fullness thereof, as the scripture says, is all made by God. And it's very, very good. It was so good that even today, to this day, creation speaks to us about God. Now, people that are experts in painting, they can, they can recognize the originator of the painting by the painting itself. It has the marks of the originator. Well, creation has the marks of God upon it. it uh, Psalm 19 says, uh, uh, David said, I want to send this to the chief musician. I'd like to set this to music. I said, David, you don't realize how much trouble setting things to music is called for some people today. This is a... Uh, very difficult. They can set it to music anyway. Put this to music. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night uttereth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And creation, that was originally very good. It's still bearing witness to God, but its voice has become muffled because of humanity's sin. It doesn't speak as loud. It doesn't speak as clear. And you can talk to creation and there's some things creation can't tell you. If you were to say, creation, sun, moon, and stars, I can see that God made you tell me about his love. <laughs> we can't tell you about that. I tell you about his grace. I'm a sinner. Creation, as I walk in the woods and listen to the birds and the bees and see the trees and hear the flowing stream, Tell me about God's grace and nature says I got this shroud. I got a shroud of death upon me. I can't testify of those things to you. I can tell you about God's power. I can tell you about God's Godhead. I can tell you about his divinity, divinity and his holiness. But I can't, I can't testify about those things because I've got the garb of mortality upon me. The truth of the matter is that creation, even though it testifies of God, it has been blanted by man's sin. The sin of humanity has polluted the environment he's in as far as it reaches. Muffled. It's not the appropriate object for our attention anymore. I know there are earth worshipers and earth day and all this sort of thing, but while we're studying creation, do you know creation's studying us? They're waiting to be delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Creation's waiting on us to be revealed. I say it's a more suitable object for you to seek the Lord, not in the sun and the moon and the stars, but to seek him in the gospel in Christ as a person, in the gospel as a message, in the word of God as the articulation of God's mind, to seek him there, because creation is a coming down. And I'm interested in eternal life. You can't get eternal life by considering and studying and probing a, a creation that's set to demise, that's determined to come down all around you. We look not at the things that are seen. That's it. It's, that's can, whether you see it in a microscope or a telescope or however you see it, if it can be seen. We don't focus our attention on those things. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says we don't focus our attention on that. Why, why not? Because the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. And I've received eternal life and this life I've got doesn't fit into this realm. I've been made for a better and bigger, a bigger world. Furthermore, the area of creation has now become an area of competition. Everything from astrology to sciences to idolatry it's become an area in which nature is viewed by man as competing with God of all things. The, the creation made by God becomes a God unto itself. 
to a fallen humanity. Even now, Job 15, 15 reminds us the heavens are not clean in his sight. God doesn't put his trust in this. He has not given everything over to Mother Nature. He's given everything over to his son. God doesn't trust creation. Not even the sun that makes its successive journeys across the sky. And the moon is faithful and the stars is faithful and the orbiting planets and all of this. God doesn't put his trust in those things. He has fully trusted the Son. He's given him all power in heaven and earth, turned everybody that belongs to him over to the Son, and he has full confidence the Son's going to bring him home. He's depending on the Son for everything. How do you think he feels about you if you don't? If God has full confidence in Christ, has not held back one thing from him, what do you suppose would be the lot of someone who has refused to do that to Christ? And has refused to trust him with their total being and all that they are. No, creation's voice has been muffled. It has been cursed because of man. Cursed! God said, cursed is the ground for your sake. Said that. Your sake. Genesis 5, 29. Noah's father said he called his name Noah because this same shall comfort us concerning the work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. <laughs> cursed it. Isaiah the 24th chapter verse 5 and 6 says, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore hath the curse devoured the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left in it. Yeah. Now the earth is cursed because of man's sin. It's not cursed because man's sin was gigantic by psychological definition. Or sociological definition. The heinousness of sin is because of its character. Not because of the quantity of it. It's his character. This happened because a couple ate a piece of fruit. Don't forget it. They ate a piece of fruit that God created. And the whole natural order is coming down because of it. So I don't want any explanations for sin. I don't want to hear about family and family traits passed down. Huh? And environmental corruption. And the fact that uh, I have bad habits. I've been born. Do I want to hear it? Don't want to hear it because it's not true. Nature, sin has a nature to it. And it has in like a virus infected the entire creation. But uh, the good news of course is that I want to touch a little bit on is that God is determined to renew it. <laughs> in fact we're part of a choir that they sing too. The whole creation. I want to read, uh, read this section of scripture. Because I want to develop this, this principle that the new can't come till the go old goes. The old's got to go before the new can come. That's a kingdom principle. You don't get new things from God till the old things go. You want new life from God, it's not going to mingle with the old life. The old life's got to go. You want the new heavens and the new earth, the old heavens and the old earth got to go. Romans 8, 19 and through 22 tells us that creation is sort of intuitively, I'm not sure how, how all of this pans out, how intelligent creation is, but it, it knows a whole lot more, I think, than some people think. It says the, whole, the earnest expectation of the cre creature or creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Oh, they're waiting to find out who we are. See, they can't tell, we can't tell, but they're waiting. For the creature itself was made subject to vanity, not willingly, that is not because they transgressed, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. <laughs> Mortality is a blessing. It's a mercy. When Adam and Eve sinned, God cast them out of the garden, and he stationed a cherubim with a flaming sword with the tree of life to keep them from the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3 tells us, lest they eat, of the tree of life and live forever. Oh, what a mercy. It's an old song we used to sing. It's not a modern, there's no overheads on this song, I don't believe. But it says, I would not live all the way. 
God in his present, present frame. He subjected the same in hope that his creation is destined to be burned up. It's, it's the earth's reserved under fire. That's what the scripture says. But it's in hope. It's not going to be exterminated. It's going to be changed, praise the Lord. Because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails together in pain until now. And yet, they're not the only ones. We too. We groan with them. And if you listen, if you listen, you can almost hear creation groaning under the burden of mortality. It started out very good and through no fault of its own. The blight of mortality has struck it. It's all going to pass away when Jesus comes again. I want to take a moment here and read from the word of God several passages that tell you that, that is going to happen. There are people that say, well, the earth really isn't going to pass away. It's just going to kind of undergo a little bit of a change, but it's really not going to pass away. But see, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of the word of God, and you ought to, not to be ashamed of it. If it says burned up, burned up. That's what, that's what I believe. It says melt, I believe. Melt. Melt. I believe that. It says we're looking for a new heavens. I, that's just what it means. Now, here's some text. Psalm 102, 25 and 26. Of all thou hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the work of thy hands. They shall perish. But thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old as a garment, as a vesture. Thou shalt change them and they shall be changed. Yes, oh, it's all going to happen. Isaiah 24, 20, vivid picture. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. And shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. It shall fall and not rise again. Oh, that's a blessed thought to think about. Isaiah, the 34th chapter, in verse 4. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Host means like stars, planets. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. The heavens shall be rolled up together as a scroll. Their host shall all fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as the falling fig from a fig tree. It's going to happen. Isaiah 51, 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at them. Look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So he tells you your faith is like a hand to your, of your soul. So he says, look, all this stuff is coming down. That's kind of not conducive to long-range planning, let me tell you. When all of that planning stuff started, I <laughs> I can still remember I was called in by some of the head shrinks, you know, and they said, oh, Mr. Blake, they said, what are your, what are your long-range plans and your short-range plans? So let's start out with a short-range plan. What's your short-range plan? I said, to make it through the end of the day. <laughs> he said, what's your long-range plan? I said, stretch as many short-term ones back to back as I can. <laughs> <laughs> See, God's told you what the long-range plan is. He's told you. He said, the whole natural order is coming down. Everything you can see, no matter what method you use to see it, it's coming down. It's not going to remain. It's going to be burned up. It's going to be rolled up. It's going to be discarded. It's not going to, so you can't become attached to it. Don't you dare knit your soul to this world. Because Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what does a person gain? If in the end of your life you go to hell, what difference does it make? Pray tell what else you did. Not at all. You can't get nipped to this world. God's told you. It's coming down. God's eternal. Jesus is eternal. The Spirit's eternal. Life is eternal. And you're made in God's image. You just can't pass away and become extinct. You're going to live on somewhere. And God said, make sure it's not here. Make sure of that. So what, what God has done in salvation is a, it's a plan to extricate humanity from a condemned house. He's he leading us out of a condemned order. Isaiah, the 65th chapter, in verse 17, says, Behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. In the glory, we'll just say, what world? I don't remember about a world. Like, it'll not be remembered nor come into mind. That's going to settle a whole lot of things right there. 
And another one, Luke 21, verse 33, our Lord Jesus, heaven and earth shall pass away. There it is, just very, very plain. And then our uh, John, 1 John 2, 17 said, the earth, uh, the, the world passes away and the lust thereof. See, the lust thereof is what connects you to the world. So not only is the world passing away, but connectivity to the world is passing away. There's going to be no means to gratify lust connected to this world after it passes away. Jesus talked about that as a condition where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. No means to appease appetites knit to the world. See, the, uh, the world is, is coming down. Everything made is coming down. Every, every, and I'm excluding personalities in this. There, there is coming down. Right here, just a word... There's a, a kind of a folksy way of looking at Jesus now. It says that he's gone away and he's been building our mansion, you know, for 2,000 years and so forth. Well, this, is, this isn't true to begin with. The kingdom has been prepared for us from before the foundation of the world. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. Jesus didn't go to start building. It's his going that started the preparing. He's readying heaven for us by being there himself. So I... Uh, if Jesus was building us a mansion, it had to go up in the Holocaust too. So that's not what he's, what he's there for. Now let's look at the logic of this destruction. <clears throat> God taught us the principle of defilement under the law. He taught us that something that is undefiled can become defiled by something that is defiled. Even though of itself, of itself, it's, it's not defiled. A defiling element put in a pure environment will defile it. Incidentally, by, uh, the scriptures do teach us that the heavens themselves were cleansed by the blood of Christ. <laughs> Just in case, in case you didn't know. It says the heaven itself was cleansed. So there was some way in which, some way in which there's a defilement. It was caused by man's sin at, at amazing uh, extensive areas. Under the law, a, a leper, for instance, a leper could defile the realm he was in, even, even though there's nothing wrong with the realm, nothing wrong with the environment where he was at, but he could defile the house where he was. Just the fact that he was a leper. You read about this in Numbers, the fifth chapter, verses two and three. And there's another uh, Haggai, and you sure want to be able to tell Brother Haggai that you read his book. <laughs> in Haggai, uh, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13, he put a little question. He said, if, I, if a, a priest has a, a holy flesh in his garment, if he, if he touches something that's unholy, will the unholy thing be made clean because he had holy, holy flesh? Will it make the unclean clean? He said, no. <laughs> no, you can't make unclean clean. No. He said, what about, what about, what about, what about uh, if, you have, if you have something unclean, can you defile something that's clean? He said, yes, yeah, oh, yes. You can take something unclean, can defile something clean. Now, what I'm getting at here is, of itself, of its own right, the creation was clean. It was very good, the scripture says. But man's sin contaminated. It makes no, far, how, no difference how far you look. You can look through a Hubble telescope as far as it can see, and man's sin has permeated that far and further. It's contaminated this realm. Why? Because this realm was made for man. The universe, the worlds, things invisible, things visible, the whole thing was made as an arena in which the drama of redemption is being completed. If it wasn't for man, this wouldn't have been made. It was made for him. And when it's, uh, we receive a new heavens and a new earth, we'll be able to occupy the whole realm. Right now we, we have enough difficulty just with the one we've got. What I'm saying is both nature and man must be born again. Both got to be born again. Both nature and man. Now with man, if he's not born again, he can't even see it. And he can't enter it. Got to be born again. But nature, nature can't participate with us unless it's born again also. And to be born again, the old's got to die. It's got to die. Your old self's got to die. Nature's got to die. Before there's a new heavens and a new earth. Why? Because Jesus said you can't take new wine and put it in an old wine skin. Because <laughs> if you do that, 
it'll break the wine skin and, and then you'll lose your wine and your wine skin too. So you can't take new wine that ferments and expands and put it in an old dry condemned wine bag. You, you can't do that and by the same token you can't take a new, new creatures and put them in an old world. Now, specifically in this text, Matthew 9, 16, and 17, Jesus was saying, you can't take the new life of the new covenant and put it in the regimen and procedures and disciplines of the old covenant. You can't do that. You, you can't proceduralize new life. You can't take new life from God and give it rules and procedures and disciplined ways of doing things. That new life can't subscribe to that. And by the same token, you can't take a regenerated world, regenerated humanity, the body of Christ in the world to come and stick it in an old heavens and an old earth. It won't, it won't work. The thing would blow apart. It can't hold us. We've got to have a new environment, total new environment for new creation. So we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. See, the new demands the removal of the old. Got to get rid of the old. The former will not be brought to mind anymore. I like this promise of our Lord in Revelation 21 5 I believe he says behold I make all things new everything I'm making can you believe that I'm making everything everything new I'll start out I'll give you a new heart I'll give you a new mind huh? I'll write my law in your hearts so I'll put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes that's, that's Bible language <laughs> that's Bible language I'll, I'll start there. But before I'm through, the entire universe is going to be made new for you. Oh, I'm telling you, if you wonder about God's love, God laid, he sent his son who laid down his life for ransom for many. He rose, he raised him from the dead and established that he was a son of God with power. He set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. God is so committed to this salvation, he's going to make everything new. <laughs> everything new. There isn't going to be anything old in the world to come. <laughs> Not a single solitary thing. That's how committed God is to your salvation. Now, when will all this, when will all this come to pass? <clears throat> it's going to come to pass when Jesus comes as a thief in the night. That, when he comes... Now, it isn't that he's going to come one time as a thief in the night and another time some other way. That's not what the scripture means. He's coming as a thief. The next time he comes, he's coming as a thief in the night. That means unexpectedly, swiftly. He's not going to send a little schedule ahead of time. See, when Jesus came the first time, he sent John the Baptist to tell the people he's coming. The next time, you better be prepared when he comes. Because if you don't, he's going to come like a thief and he's going to take away everything the ungodly hold precious. You're not coming to us as the thief. You're not of the night, Paul said, that that day should take you unaware. I mean, you're not. He's not going to come like a thief to you who are waiting for him and looking for him. You're expecting him, see? You're expecting him to come. But he's coming as a thief in the night unexpectedly, suddenly, to snatch away everything men have put their faith and hope and trust in. He's going to take it away. And they will not have access to it anymore again. As a thief. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, verse 42 and 43. Watch therefore, ye know not the what hour your Lord may come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Oh, you're, you're a watchman. As an individual, you're a watchman. Your job is to get your eyes open and look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's your job. Your job is to build a house that Jesus won't break up when he comes here. If you built your house on the sand, he'll break it up. If you built this house with temporal values, he'll break it up. See, it's all going to come down. He's coming as a thief of the night. You've got to build a house that will survive the coming of the Lord. You know, what, are you, what is our joy? He said, I believe the Thessalonians, what is our joy? Even you, it says, in the presence at the coming of the Lord. <laughs> at the coming of the Lord, that's when we're going to kind of flower out. When everything else is going away, we'll, we'll surface as the glorious children of God. 
1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 2 and 3, says, Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief of the night. I mean, this is integral to sound doctrine. You, you know this. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a woman upon, uh, as a, uh, as a uh, travail on a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. Well, yeah, so much for the sneak them out of the world theory. Hmm? Goes under the sneak them out of the world theory. That is that God comes and sneaks the church out. The wicked escaped at that present time. <laughs> they are going to escape when Jesus comes. His glory is going to devour the adversary. It's going, it's going to happen. So all nature is going to go up when Jesus comes again. It's going to be a public snatching, not a private one. I mean, folk come. Folk, the Lord Jesus snuck in the first time. He's not sneaking in again. First time, they didn't know who he was. Second time, they'll know who he is. I said, this is the lamb. That's who this is. Hide us from the wrath of the lamb. And it, uh, Many years ago, we were having a meeting up here, and uh, I'll never forget this. We were talking about this text, about the wicked crawling out for the rocks and mountains. And there's a brother visiting with us. He says, and he said, and he called for the rocks and mountains to fall on him, and the rocks and mountains said, we can't help you. We got to go too. <laughs> so you see, when Jesus comes, he's going to take away everything that people have taken hold of that's, that's not eternal. And he's going to take away all their hope. The hope of the wicked is going to perish. It's going to do it. It's going to perish. And people that have knit their souls to things that aren't eternal, they're going to be left bereft and naked before the Lord of glory. And everything they treasured will be consumed when the Lord come again. Ultimately, what's going to cause this to pass away is not the, the A-bomb. Well, of course, it's the hydrogen bomb and other bombs now. I guess those men that had to revise their theology when they come up with bigger, bigger bombs, but that's not what's going to destroy it. It's, it's going to be the glory of God that's going to destroy it, folks. Now, I want, to, I want to establish this to you. That in the Bible, whenever God's glory was revealed, even if it was at a minuscule level, it caused a tremendous amount of disruption to nature. Now, you can go back down there to Mount Sinai. Now, God, his, uh, the script says his feet touched the mount, you know. That is a very abbreviated exposure to God compared, say, to Christ or compared to the end of the world. Very abbreviated, but I'll tell you that Sinaitic Peninsula almost exploded. <laughs> Lit up the whole countryside, the mountains shake, storms, tempest, lightning, fire. Oh, nature couldn't abide. That was just a little bit of glory. Showing here that glory is disruptive to nature. Not only the end of the world, but it is now too. <laughs> And you could take uh, at the crucifixion of Christ. At the crucifixion of Christ, the scripture says there was an earthquake. <laughs> Darkness covered, one gospel writer says, the whole earth. Darkness covered the earth and the graves were opened up. <laughs> and after he rose, some saints rose and went into the city and testified to some. Oh, I, I want to know more about that. <laughs> I want to know more about it. See, it was disruption of nature. That was just a... That was God's wrath made known there, see? He was wrath was revealed against ungodliness there in Christ. As he bore our sins in his body in the tree, and that was disruptive, highly disruptive to nature. As a matter of fact, as his resurrection, the same, the same thing occurred in his resurrection. An angel descended from heaven and <laughs> the earthquake happened, and it was a violent affair. And even at Pentecost, it was sort of subdued, but it was a sound of a rushing mighty wind filled all the houses they were sitting there. Kind of things were kind of unsettled. It, it wasn't a normal Pentecost. I've wondered about those poor old Jews. They expecting a regular, you know, regular Pentecost day. <laughs> kind of like, you know, a lot of our churches. Nobody ever really expects anything to happen. You know, we, we go. And <laughs> but it was disruptive. Glory is disruptive to the natural order. Whenever God comes down, man goes out. You know, when he was in the temple... And in the tabernacle, when both the tabernacle and temple were dedicated, the glory of God come down, filled it. When it filled it, the, no man could go in. Just, it ex, expelled everything else. Well, that's what's going to happen. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, his glory. See, our God's a consuming fire. A fire goes out before him and consumes the adversaries. This is the way God is. It's a mercy to us. God has not unveiled himself in his fullness to us. We'd all been consumed. 
No man can see my face and live, God said. Because there's such a conflict between nature and divinity. There's such a conflict it can't, it can't survive. So when our Lord Jesus comes again, he's going to come in unprecedented glory. It's un never been glory like when Jesus comes again. Listen to these, uh, to these texts. I believe some of these have been read, read before. Matthew 16, 27. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Now, his Father's got a lot of glory. Now, let's, let's take another one here. Matthew 24 and verse 30. Then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great, great glory. Great glory. Sort of the capstone on this is Luke the ninth, chapter verse 26. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, and of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. I figure that's, that's all the glory there is. That's, that's it. All of his glory, all the Father's glory, all the angels' glory, nature's not going to be able to survive. That's what Revelation 20 and verse 11 says, that uh, the one sitting on the throne from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. <laughs> it's going to happen. Someday the curtain's going to be pulled back. And he's going to show his son, who's the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords, dwelling in light no man can approach unto. And when he unveils it, nature's going to shake down, reel to and fro like a drunken man, be broken up like a cottage and fall and not rise again. It's going to happen. Now for some, this is a scary proposition because it's the shaking of all things. Yet this word, yet once more I will shake all things, signifies the removing of the things that can be seen. Hebrews 12, 26 and 27 says. But they're removed so the things that can't be seen may remain. That means they're here now. They may remain. We having received a kingdom, huh? That cannot be shaken. See, it does not yet appear what we shall be. Why doesn't appear? Why doesn't it appear what we shall be? Because nature has covered it over. It's just like a veil, just like Christ's flesh was a veil to His divinity. Nature's a veil to the kingdom we've received. But when when the natural order passes away. Well, folk won't think we're fools anymore. Let me put it that way. Amen. We'll just say, Lord, he says, this is the God. This is our God. Yeah. This, is, this is the one we told you about. Huh? This is him. He's going to come and he's going to save us. Now, I wanted to close here. As I say, this could be a frightening thing to, to young men and women. And I, well, I really think some young men and women need to be scared. <laughs> See, the conduct of some of them, I think they ought to be scared. See, there's a good part to this. There's a good part to this. Because everything that's bad, everything this week, every trial, every setback, every stress is all related to nature. Every single bit of it. And when the natural order passes away, <laughs> all that's going to pass away too. Conflict to pass away. <laughs> Weakness will pass away, temptation will pass away, handicap will pass away, jeopardy will pass away, the enemy of our soul will pass away, principalities and powers will pass away. When our Lord comes again, when the great conflagration begins, I imagine it just being a moment of twinkling of an eye, when everything's going up in smoke, we'll say, farewell, sorrow, <laughs> and farewell, sickness. They won't be sick anymore. Farewell trial. <laughs> Farewell trouble. It's all tied to nature. Farewell testing. Farewell failure. Oh, it's going to be gone. Farewell death. <laughs> Farewell opposition and warfare. We'll beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks and study war no more. Huh? Yeah.
Because it's all related to nature. It's all related to time. It's all related to what's passing away. All your difficulties, all your disappointments, all your perplexities, every time you're cast down, all your thorns, all your hunger, all your thirst, all your pilgrimship, all your strangership, it's all connected with time and with nature and with this world and it's all going to pass away when the heavens and the earth that now are pass away. So I say we can haste <laughs> unto the coming of the day of our God. You know, in the scripture told of a prodigal son that came home <coughs> his father saw him afar off and his father ran to meet him I, I'm, I can identify with the prodigal I'm sure you can too but we're, we're one up on the prodigal now now we see the savior coming and we're running to meet him <laughs> hey we're running to meet him we say even so what's that Jesus well, what is that Jesus what did you say behold I come quickly and my reward is with me. John says, Amen. <laughs> Come just that way. Amen. In a moment. In a twinkling of an eye. Now I ask you. I mean, like, are you ready? We've got in our day and age. With a lot of fictitious type evangelism. A foot in the land. We've got methods and techniques in professed churches that allow people a lot of time to get oriented and to learn and to kind of come up to speed. And I'm telling you, we don't know that we have that much time. The night is far spent Amen. and the day is at hand. It's high time to awake out of sleep for the day of our salvation is nearer than when we first began. And if you have ever in your lifetime been closer to God than you are tonight you had better adjust your sails you had better change and now and get ready for the coming of the Lord because that's all God's thinking about that's all Jesus is thinking about he's thinking about when he's going to come again and take us to himself he has volunteered as I understand scripture. Scripture tells us that the son that himself doesn't even know when he's going to come. I believe he, this is part of his humility that he has volunteered to forego that in order that he might fellowship with us. <laughs> he's anxious too. Now tell me the truth. Aren't you anxious for the old order to pass away? <laughs> well I'm here to tell you it is. It's going to pass away and there's no need for you to to pass away with it. When Jesus one time was uh, went to visit the pool of Bethesda, <clears throat> he found a man there that was lame. Well, actually, the, it was full of impotent folk, but he just picked out one man that day. He came to him and he asked him a simple question. He said, "Would you would you like to be made whole?" The man said, "Oh, yeah, yes." I want to be made whole. I do. Count tells us that some people question the account, but they that an angel come down, trouble the waters, whoever got in first was healed. And sick folk aren't generally real polite, and so they be crawled over this fellow, and he could never get in. He said, I, I can't get in the water. In time, Jesus said to him, he said, well, just, uh, just to pick up your bed and walk. You just pick it up and walk. Now, how, how's this man going to pick up his bed and walk? He's never walked in his entire life, huh? How's he going to do that? Jesus didn't give him a procedure. Well, he gave him a procedure to pick up your bed and walk. <laughs> how's he going to do that? There's really, there's really only one thing that man could do. And that's want, want to get up and walk. And when his will came into play the Lord Jesus strengthened him to stand up and walk now I'm telling you you can want if you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord if you want to be ready when heaven and earth passes away if you want to be ready if you want to Jesus will empower you to be ready may the Lord bless you to be ready for the coming of the Lord